the book of Revelation can be an incredibly confusing and even frightening read, but it wasn't meant to be either. In fact, behind the violent and alarming imagery of Revelation lies a world of beauty as we see the self-sacrificial love of Christ forever triumph over the darkness we encounter all too often in our world. Join us as we take a deeper look at what the disciple John wrote and why. Dispel common misconceptions of what it all means and celebrate the glorious future it promises in our series, Rescuing Revelation. Good morning, Woodland Hills. So good to see you all here this morning. I don't know about you, but I, I am hot. The, the, those last couple songs, I, I, I am, maybe it's just me, but, but I just, you can't help but start to move and groove and, and jump and whatever. So I'm... <laughs> a little bit hot here. I, I want to ditto what uh, Vanessa just said uh, about this, this congregation. I love, what I love is coming here at different, time, different times throughout the week, and the building is noisy and busy. Uh, and it's noisy and busy because you've got people lining up for food, and you've got people dropping off you know, the kids at the daycare center, and you've got people in the disabilities ministries, and you've got people coming in for job training, and we've got all this stuff going on. And we're just partnering with all these different folks. We're blessing them. They're blessing us. And it is just a kingdom thing of beauty. I just love seeing that. And I'm very proud. <laughs> yes, amen. And it's, it's people being willing to bleed that makes that possible. Like this last thing with the, the Merrick Food Shelf. Uh, it's, you know, we put a challenge out there, and you guys respond with 700 pounds of food and $17,000. And so a whole lot of people are going to be eating who otherwise wouldn't eat. And that's, that's about as keen as it gets. So thank you. I appreciate your uh, stepping up and your sacrifice. Amen. Thanks also to Shauna, the lovely Shauna Bourne, for preaching last week. Isn't she great? I just love her. She's just fantastic. We're blessed to have her here. So we're in this series on Revelation. Um, this funky series on Revelation. I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm really getting into it. I'm loving this. Uh, and today I want to talk about Holy War. That's the title of this, Holy War. I'm going to be talking about the way God does warfare and the way God judges in the book of Revelation. And all of the violence, or the apparent violence in the book of Revelation, surround this, these two concepts, God's war and God's judgment. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. We've seen that the, the Revelation is an apocalyptic prophetic book, and its apocalyptic dimension is captured in the fact that it uses graphic symbols that aren't meant to be taken literally. You've got to think like a Picasso painting when you're dealing with the book of Revelation. It's highly symbolic. It is about events that happen at the end of the first century, but it also communicates realities, spiritual realities, that are true for God's people since the time of the cross and the resurrection. And so it applies to us today. It has some, a vision of the future. We'll talk about that tomorrow, uh, next week. But it's not primarily about the future. Uh, it's about the life we are in right now. Now, I'm going to warn you. This message here is going to be about as intense and dense theologically as any message I've ever given, and that's saying quite a bit. Uh, it's going to be challenging. I wouldn't preach like this every week. You'd, you'd, you'd be, people would burn out. But this week is going to be challenging, so I'm going to ask you to really be paying close attention. Uh, take notes if that helps you. Um, it, it's the kind of message you might have to chew on uh, several times. I, I know this is a perspective that is new to most folks. It's not at all new in the academic community. People who specialize in the book of Revelation have been saying this for you know, forever. But uh, um, the evangelical subculture comes out of uh, uh, the fundamentalist culture, which comes in part out of the whole apocalyptic movement of the 19th century, where they first began to read Revelation as a literal snapshot of the future. That was a new view in the 19th century. But it's become part of the evangelical culture, so most evangelicals that I've met don't even know of a different way of reading the book of Revelation. And so my burden here is to try to take the stuff which is locked up in these academic archives and communicate it here at a level that, that uh, uh, us non-academics can understand. But it's, 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 it's fairly intense. In fact, I will tell you that I don't recall ever being so frustrated putting together a message in my life because I had to cut out so much good stuff to get it down to, to this. Saturday morning was a sad morning for me. It's like, goodbye. I had to let that go and let that go. And it was just tough. But um, uh, so I, even now, it's probably going to still be too long. And I got to quit talking about it. Otherwise, I'm not going to get into it. Uh, I'll probably go over as it is. So uh, here's the question for today. Does God, or how does God engage in warfare? And how does God uh, bring about judgment? And more specifically, does God 
Does God ever have to engage in violence when he engages in warfare in the, in the book of Revelation and when he brings about a judgment? It looks like he does if you're taking this book literally. But what I want to do today is give three examples. So three examples of the way John takes violent symbols and ingeniously turns them on their head so that they mean their opposite. Not only nonviolence, but anti-violence. All right? And so uh, I want to show a pattern here, which if, 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 if the coin drops in the slot and you get what's going on here, um, well, this book will be a very different book than you, you've read before. It'll have a very different kind of a meaning. I feel such an urgency about this because oh, I think so much hangs on this. It's not just the meaning of the book of Revelation, as important as that is in and of itself, but your reading of this will affect your view of God, your view of Jesus, and your view of your life here and now. This is the book that is most appealed to to legitimize violence among Christians. Yeah, well, Jesus was a pacifist and won the Gospels, but what about the end of time? He comes back, and apparently God has to use violence to solve the problem of evil, so if God does it, we should do it. And here we go again. Uh, A lot hangs on this, and so please uh, put on your thinking caps and let's dive in. The first thing I have to do is set up a framework before I get to my three examples. And here I'm going to summarize in five minutes about seven pages of material that I had to take out. (laughs) Uh, But it it, it just sets the context here. And it has to do with the role of truth and deception in the book of Revelation. All right? Now, we need to remember that John is, is writing to encourage these Christians in the province of Asia who are facing imminent persecution and even likely martyrdom. Uh, They are a small group of people who are standing up to the ways of the Roman Empire, and Rome is about to bite back. Now, throughout the book of Revelation, Rome and all the empires of the world are symbolized by the symbol of Babylon. comes out of the book of Daniel, became sort of the archetype for all the evil empires of the world. And by the beast, which, which emphasizes the ferociousness of the empires of the world, the violence of the empires of the world, and the prostitute which represents the immorality and the idolatry of all the empires of the world. All of those refer to all the empires of the world. And they're all, in the book of Revelation, they're all under the authority of the dragon and are given power by the dragon. You read about that in Revelation 13. I had this long thing in Revelation 13 that I had to take out, but you'll see there that that the the dragon gives power and authority to the beast. And um, uh, that's what makes him so powerful and so mighty. So these Christians are refusing to conform to the ways of the beast, and the beast is about to devour them. Now, to the natural eye, it looks like the beast is going to win. To the natural eye, it looks like that, that dragon is, is all-powerful, and it looks like that beast, who has power from the dragon, uh, is, is, is going to squish this little Jesus movement. It looks like, to the natural eye, like the mighty Rome, with all their military forces, is going to come and squash this little humble Jesus movement like a giant would squash an ant. So it looks like the kind of power that rules the world is the power of the state, the power of the sword, the power of violence, the power of guns, bombs, bullets, and and mayhem. And that it's going to overthrow the humble, self-sacrificial power of the cross. That's what it looks like. But it's it's like what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1, that to the world, the crucified Christ is foolish and weak. And those who follow the way of the crucified Christ look foolish and weak. But to us, Paul says, no, we're, we're to trust that this is the power of God. This is what God Almighty looks like when he flexes his omnipotent muscle. It looks like getting crucified. And so Revelation is written to remind these Christians of this truth. The the appearance that they lose when they die is a lie. It's a deception. And so you find throughout the book of Revelation this strong theme about deception. The dragon, Satan, is, is, is said to nine different times he's called the deceiver or the one who deceives the nations or the one who deceives the entire world. The world's under this deception, and under that deception, it looks like getting crucified means you lose. But followers of the Lamb are to remember that getting crucified is the way that you win. And the truth is that on Calvary, the Lamb has already defeated Satan and Babylon. The truth is that in manifesting God's true character, which is his self-sacrificial love, God has overcome Satan and Babylon's military power. It's just that the world under the deception of the dragon doesn't see that yet. But we are to know the secret of the scroll that we talked about two weeks ago. This is why it's a secret. It, most don't get this, but it's a secret of how God rules and how God overcomes, which is a secret of God's true slain lamb-like character. Everything in the, in the book of Revelation is about the unveiling of the victory of the cross. And so remember in, in Revelations 1.4, I mentioned this two weeks ago, it, it says that John wrote down everything that he saw which was the word of God, even the testimony of Jesus. 
This is what he saw. The word of God and the testimony of Jesus, which is all about the victory of the cross. Jesus dying and then rising from the dead, defeating Satan. Uh, it's called the apocalypse for this reason. Apocalypse means unveiling. It doesn't mean the unveiling of the destruction of the end of the world, the, at the end of the world, though that's what people think it means today. This is the unveiling of Jesus Christ. Verse 1 in chapter 1 says the unveiling of Jesus Christ. All of this is, is an unveiling of the truth of who Jesus is, who God is, and, and how God rules the world and defeats evil. And all of that goes back to the victory of the cross. Um, it, 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 it's a matter of manifesting this truth. So the battle's already been fought. The decisive battle's already been fought and won by the Lamb. Now the only remaining battle is the battle of proclaiming that truth against the lies and holding fast to that truth against the lies. The, the, the battles of the book of Revelation are not actual physical battles. The, the only physical battle was fought back at Calvary, and that's how God fights. He fights not by making others bleed, but by bleeding at the hands of others. And that's how he wins. Now the question is, who will believe that and who won't? And the battle is between those who hold fast to the truth and therefore trust in the power of the Lamb, and those who don't trust in the power of the Lamb, who are yet under deception, and therefore trust the power of Babylon. It's a question of, of do, you, do, you, do you follow the ways of the Lamb or follow the ways of the empire? Are you in the truth or are you in the lie? That's the battle that needs to be fought and symbolized throughout the book of Revelation. And so this book is written to tell these Christians, don't buy the lie. Don't just go by appearances. Don't take up arms against your enemies. Instead, live according to the truth. And the truth is that you're victorious when you hold fast to the ways of the Lamb, even when you're crucified. In fact, that is your, that is your victory because that was his victory. You participate in his victory by following his example, even to the point of death. And so what I want to do now is illustrate how the battle of truth versus deception gets played out in three examples, three main examples in, in Revelation. And in the process, we're going to show how John takes these violent images and ingeniously subverts them and turns them on their heads so they have the opposite kind of meaning. Now, the main way he does that is by taking a symbol and just opposing it with a symbol that is its contradictory or appears to be its contradictory. So we saw in Revelation 5. There's the mighty lion that looks like a violence image, the triumphant tribe of Judah, light of the tribe of Judah. But then the lion becomes the little slain lamb. And John is thereby saying that, yes, Jesus is a lion, certainly is a lion, but he's a lion in a lamb-like way. He's, he roars like a lion, but he roars with self-sacrificial love. He defeats his foes, but not by preying on them, but rather by laying down his life and being preyed by them. They're the predators, and he offers his life up for that. So he's, he's a lion in a very lamb-like way and a lion in a lion-like way. So our first example it shows another way in which John subverts these symbols. It has to do with the mysterious 144,000, in the book of, which places a significant role in the book of Revelation. This is the army of God, the army of God, the army of the Lamb. They're first introduced in Revelation 7. And we read this. He says, Then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. Notice, John heard that, okay? And that'll become important here in a moment. He heard that. Now, this 144,000 was a symbol uh, in, in, in Jewish circles of the end times army. There's going to be 144,000 who would follow the Messiah and would violently overthrow Rome and therefore violently reestablish Israel as a sovereign nation. That was the belief. So this is a violent military symbol. We're going to see how John takes that violent military symbol and subverts it to make a, become a lamb-like symbol. Um, he hears 144,000, and then he hears, right after this, uh, the listing of the 12 tribes of Israel, and he hears that 12,000 troops came from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, that 12 is going to be significant. It's not co a coincidence that 12 times 12 equals 144, uh, because we're not talking about a literal... The literal Israel, or the literal tribes of Israel here, or literal 12,000 troops. In fact, it can't be the literal 12 tribes of Israel, because if you read them, they're not the 12 tribes of Israel. You've got names missing that should be there, and names included that shouldn't be there, and the order's all wrong. And all of that has certain symbolic significance that I can't get into right now. But, but the, 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 he's not speaking literal language here, he's speaking Picasso language, apocalyptic language here. The important point for us to see, however, is this. John hears that, but when he looks, he sees something very different. And this is one of the main ways that John subverts violent symbols. He, he frees us from our addiction to Babylon power by hearing a Babylon thing, 
but then seeing a Calvary thing. And the Calvary thing he sees transforms the meaning of what he just heard. You following this? So whenever you find John saying, I heard, pay close attention, because pretty soon you're going to have him say, and I saw. And what he saw will transform the meaning of what he heard. So here's what it looks like here. He, when he looks, he sees this in verse 9. It says, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. Wait, you just told us it was 144,000. They were from every nation. This was supposed to be a Jewish army. But no, this is from every nation, every tribe, every people, every language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hand. So he hears 144,000 soldiers, composed of 12,000 soldiers from the 12 tribes of Israel. But when he looks, he sees a great multitude that no one could count. It's that great. And they're no longer distinctly Jewish. They're from every tribe and every tongue. And so what he sees transforms what he hears. In several ways. First of all, it's no longer a distinctly Jewish army. This is an international army. Secondly, it's no longer a literal 144,000. Sorry, Jehovah Witnesses. This is a symbolic 144,000. So then the question is, how how would 144,000 be a symbol of 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 an innumerably great uh, uh, army from every tribe and every, uh, every tongue? Well, pay attention to the numbers. Remember, numbers in apocalyptic literature are never numbers. They're symbols of things. And 12 plays an especially important role in Revelation. Um, the, the, the two main 12s in the Bible are the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles. And so as we saw two weeks ago, there's 24 elders in the throne room, and that's because the elders represent God's people in both testaments, from the 12 tribes of Israel and, and founded on the 12 apostles, 24. It's not a coincidence, as I said before, that here we have 12 times 12 equaling 144. Um, it, it's a, the, the multiplication of the two testaments. And then you multiply that by 1,000 and you get 144,000. Why multiply it by 1,000? Because 1,000 is a standard apocalyptic symbol for something that is indefinitely large or indefinitely long. When you see 1,000, don't be thinking literal. Be thinking of something that goes on ages and ages or goes on you know, it, 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 beyond counting. So you've got the 12 times 12 and it's innumerably large from every net tribe and every tongue. And so John, when he looks, he sees the meaning of the 144,000. It's not a literal thing. It's a symbolic thing. And its meaning is given in what he sees from every tribe and every tongue. No longer a distinctly Jewish. So this 144,000 represents the perfect completeness of an innumerably large group of people throughout history that have followed the ways of God. Uh, it, it's God's way of saying the army, the army of God is much greater than you previously thought. And see, the reason why John is communicating to this to his audience is that as this little group of people meeting in little house churches are taking a stand against Rome, this is the mouse that roared, you know? These little people, as they're facing Rome, and now Rome's coming to their area, they've already seen other brothers and sisters slaughtered by Rome, and now they're facing likely death, they would likely feel very alone, very isolated. And John is saying to him, the Lord is saying through John, you are not alone, no, you are part of an army. An army that lays down their life for others. You're part of something that is, is, is beyond comprehension in terms of its size. You are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Be encouraged. They're cheering you on. They went before you. Um, you, you have got, you're part of a movement that goes back in time and goes forward in time. And someday it will all be clear how you were victorious precisely when the world thought that you lost. And so he's encouraging them to stand strong. The second thing, that the way that John transforms this military image is you'll notice that this army is holding palm branches, and palm branches are the symbol of worship, and they're standing around the throne worshiping God. They're not fighting this army here, or they are fighting, but they're fighting by worshiping. John isn't saying this army doesn't fight. He's simply saying this is the way this army fights. They fight by worshiping. And so also with us, folks, our battle is never against flesh and blood, never. It's against principalities and powers and rulers and authority in, in dark places. And the way that we fight is by worshiping the Lamb. Uh, and not just with our songs, but with our life. We ascribe worth to the Lamb by saying, you are worth following. You are worth dying for. All right? So they worship the Lamb, and precisely as they do that, you're confronting the beast and confronting the dragon, confronting the powers, confronting the empire, confronting the prostitute. As you follow the Lamb wherever he goes, you will not conform to the ways of Babylon. This, this motif of following the Lamb is fleshed out in some uh, brilliant ways in, in, later on in chapter 14 of Revelation. Look at this. He says, They sang a new song before the throne, and before the four living creatures and the elders. A new song. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who have been redeemed from the earth. 
These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they remain virgins. They follow the Lamb wherever he goes. Okay, the point about this not defiling themselves with women is a military metaphor. Uh, Jews, before they went into warfare, and it was always men doing this, they had to abstain from having sex with their wives for a day and sometimes a week prior to battle. It was a way of purifying themselves. And it's a very sexist culture, so they say that sex is defiling, having sex with a woman defiles them. But that's the metaphor, so that's what we got to deal with. Um, and so this is a military metaphor of people who are purifying themselves to go into battle. So here, the symbol of virginity is, is a, a hyperbolic expression of that. These, these guys don't abstain for a week or, or, or a day. Their whole life is abstaining. And by the way, if you meet someone who takes 144,000 literally and thinks that they're one of the 144,000, ask them if they're a virgin. <laughs> Probably none of your business, but it is a theological point. Because if they're not, well, then if you're thinking literally, you can't, you don't qualify. But this is just a symbol of people. <laughs> Awkward. <laughs> it's a symbol of, of, of folks who are not following the ways of the prostitute. They are abstaining from the ways of the empire, the immorality and the idolatry of the empire. And in doing that, they've, they've purified themselves. And the song they sing. It's a song of the redeemed. It's a song of redemption. It's a song of the victory of the Lamb. And you find this song popping up several times in the book of Revelation. It's a song about how the Lamb has triumphed. That slain of the Lamb has triumphed by laying down its life. And they're singing this song. Only they can sing this song. Only they can learn this song. Because, well, for the same reason that only the Lamb could open the scroll. Remember that two weeks ago? Who was worthy? Well, only the Lamb was worthy because only the Lamb had the character of the scroll. The secret of how God rules and how God triumphs in the end. Uh, these folks are the only ones who sing this song because they're the only ones who are willing to follow this song. They're the only ones who could possibly celebrate the fact that they might get killed. <laughs> no one else wants to sing this song. Babylon doesn't sing this song. No, Babylon sings a song about how you killed your foes in order that you didn't die. These people are singing the song that they triumph by being willing to die. You see, so the, only those who have the character that, want, that trust in the lamb power and want to follow the lamb power can sing a celebratory song about the lamb power. Everyone else is going to think it's weak and foolish. And by the way, this applies to the whole book of Revelation. This theme is, is all over the place. You'll only see what this book is up to if you want to see what this book is up to. If you want violence, you want Babylon power, you, you get off on, on the guns and, and the bombs and bullets and yay us, well, then you'll find that here because that's what you're looking for. Oh, you feel justified. Jesus kills a bunch of people. Yay. But if you trust that God really does look like the slain lamb, you trust that Calvary reveals God's character, and you have a heart that wants to follow that, well, then when you read the book of Revelation, you'll be looking for that. And John, and what I'm showing here is that John gives you the clues as to how to see it. It's all over the place here, if you want to see. That's why I say Revelation is a Rorschach test. What you find in it is going to say a whole lot about your theology, a whole lot about what kind of power you trust, a whole lot about your character. Only those who have a lamb's heart can see the scroll, uh, interpret the scroll, can sing this song, can see death as a, a form of triumph. Okay, the army does warfare by worshiping the lamb, following the lamb wherever he goes. You have that phrase, they follow the lamb wherever they, he goes. An army that follows a little sheep. It's a, literally, it's a silly metaphor, but, but symbolically, it's so profound. They do exactly what the lamb does. And so when they're persecuted, they don't fight back. Uh, and this doesn't mean, by the way, that you don't have boundaries in your life and you let people walk all over you. No, no, you, you love your neighbor as, you, as yourself. And the per, per, Jesus ran from crowds sometimes when he hit his limit. So it's not saying that. It's about what kind of attitude do you have towards enemies, towards persecutors, towards those who are, are, are working against you? Do you retaliate? Do you sink to their level? Do you try to win with Babylon power, manipulation power, coercion power? Or do you remain like a little humble lamb, even to the point of death? They follow the lamb wherever he goes. And the final way that John transforms this military symbol of the 144,000 is this. In, in, in Revelation 7, where these, they're first introduced, a few verses after he introduces them, uh, an elder in the throne room approaches him, and he, he says this. These, referring to the 144,000, are they who have come out of the great tribulation, where they were martyred. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now, again, if you're taking this book literally, how on earth can you wash your robes and make them white if you're washing them in blood? They're going to be red. Sorry. Uh, no, th this, is, this is, literally, it's, it's absurd, but symbolically, it's profound. This also is a military symbol. It was the case that uh, in, uh, among the Jews, to uh, have blood splattered on you made you ceremonially unclean. 
And so to re-enter society, when you came back from battle with blood on you, you had to go through a purification process that included washing your robes, getting all the blood off of you, uh, and all the blood off your clothes. That's what's going on here. But notice how, what John does. It's so profound, what he does with this symbol. These, these warriors aren't washing blood off their clothes. They're washing their clothes with blood. And these people aren't washing the blood of foes off uh, uh, of them. They're washing the blood of their captain onto them. They're washing the robe in the, uh, in, in the blood of the one that they followed in the battle. Not only that, but these people are not washing their clothes after a battle. These people are washing their clothes before the battle. Uh, it's John's way of saying these people have already overcome. The battle's already been fought. It was fought on Calvary. Uh, and you are victorious when you are willing to follow the ways of Calvary. And this phrase, by the blood of the Lamb, it, it uh, refers not just to the fact that we're cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, but that we participate in the blood of the Lamb. We follow the ways of the blood of the Lamb. Like when Paul says, if we suffer with him, we will reign with him. We participate. We're in solidarity with him. And so but we're washed by the blood of the Lamb. And, and, and the moment we do that, we are victorious. And that's a theme that runs throughout the book of Revelation. Uh, in Revelation 12, for example, we read, they triumphed over him. How? By the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. That's how we win. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. How do you win in the kingdom? You don't love your life so much as to shrink from death. How do you win in the kingdom? You win by the blood of the Lamb. Believing and trusting in the blood of the Lamb, but also participating in the blood of the Lamb. How do you win in the kingdom? You win by the word of your testimony and remaining true to that. That the truth is that Calvary has already won. Uh, the devil's already been defeated. The ways of the empire are already obsolete. And we are just going to live according to the truth of that and therefore confront all the lies that say that that is not true. So John takes this military symbol and completely, it, now it means it's opposite. Yeah, we are an army, but uh, not like the world's army. And yeah, we fight, but not like the world fights. Uh, instead of killing foes and conquering foes and washing their blood off of us, we, we lay down our life. Uh, we bleed for others, to feed others, to help others, to wash people's feet. And if need be, we, we, we bleed with our very life. And that is how we are victorious. What looks like loss to the world is, in truth, victory. And this is the army of the victorious ones. Okay, now let's turn to the, the, uh, another very violent symbol. It's the Battle of Armageddon. Famous Battle of Armageddon, about which so much has been written. It has been described as the bloodiest passage in the Bible. Though I'm going to submit to you that there's not a drop of blood in it. All right? But the crucial verses are 13 through 15. This is the, the end times battle. And it says that Jesus is dressed in a robe that is dipped or could be soaked in blood. And his name is the word of God. And remember, folks, everything John saw was the word of God, which is the testimony of Jesus. It all is about this. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. Now, on the surface, if you take it literally, this is a bloody massacre. But by now, we should be aware that John uses standard violent imagery in very non-standard ways. So we've got to pay close attention, because he'll, he'll give us clues as to what is really going on here. He uses this image of a, this, this warrior soaked in blood, coming back from battle, soaked in blood. You find this three times in the Old Testament. You find it in the apocalyptic literature. The victory is like the brave heart. You know, you come back, you're covered with blood, but you're still standing. It's kind of your badge of honor. I slaughtered them, they did not slaughter me. And he's going to use this ghoulish image, but he transforms it in a, in a profound way. You find in the Old Testament applied to God, because those folks didn't have the revelation that we have. They didn't know the secret of the scroll. They didn't know God's true character. And so they were right when they thought that God fights and God wins, but they just didn't quite get then how God fights and how God wins. Now we're getting on the inside of this, seeing what's really going on. Uh, in Revelation, Jesus, like that warrior, he has, he's wearing robes that are soaked in blood. But notice that this warrior is soaked in blood before he goes into battle, not afterwards. Uh, and it's, it's, it's because this warrior fights not by shedding their blood, but by allowing his own blood to be shed. He fights. He's going into battle uh, by, by, by virtue of bleeding. So he's covered in blood. And his army who rides behind him? They're, they're, they're wearing linen that's white and clean. This isn't typical military fatigue, folks. No, they're white and clean. We just saw it because they've been washed in the blood. They, are, they don't cling to their own lives. This is the army that goes into battle. How do they do it? By carrying swords? No, by being willing to lay down their life, by being faithful to the Lamb, following the Lamb wherever he goes, by refusing to be co-opted by the ways of the empire. That's how they do warfare. 
This isn't an actual battle. The actual battle has already been fought and won, and that was on Calvary. And everything in the book of Revelation is simply about manifesting the truth of that victory. In fact, in fact, if you read the first 10 verses of this chapter, 919, they celebrate the victory of the Lamb. It's all about celebrating the one who has overcome. Well, if the battle is still in the future, how could they be already celebrating the one who's overcome? It's because the battle in which you overcame is in the past. It's already done. Now the only remaining battle is who will believe it and who won't. <laughs> I thought a gun just went off there. I'm laying down my life for the lamb. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the only remaining battle is who will believe it and who won't. Uh, will the truth overcome the lies? Will you be in deception or will you live according to truth? Will you trust lamb power or Babylon power? That's why, folks, the sword that Jesus has going into battle comes out of his mouth. What kind of warrior does that? Fight you with my tongue, neck. No, it's, it, it, this, is, he, 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 this is the word of truth that comes out. He speaks the truth. And in speaking the truth, he slays lies. Uh, and, and these are symbolized as the nations that are in bondage. But they're not literal nations. If there were literal nations that were slain, then how could we find them up again being redeemed in the next chapter? <laughs> he slays the lies in order to free the nations, to free the people. He doesn't slaughter the people. And so this is the Jesus on the cross who is now, through his people, proclaiming the truth. And they're modeling the truth. They're living the truth. And while the world sees them as weak and foolish, they are to know the secret of the scroll, which is the secret of Calvary, which is the secret of the book of Revelation. And that is that what look, looks like weakness and, and loss to the world is actually strength and victory in the kingdom of God. Laying down your lives. Amen. All right. And then finally, let's talk about God's method of judgment. And to do that, I want to turn to... What is uh, arguably the next most graphic violent image in the book of Revelation it has to do with this wine press where the grapes get trampled out. It says in Revelation 14, verses 18 through 20, Another angel who had charge of the fire came from the altar and called in a loud voice to him who had a sharp sickle, Take your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of grapes from the earth's vine, because its grapes are ripe. The angel swung his sickle on the earth, gathered its grapes, and threw them into the great winepress of God's wrath. They were trampled in the winepress outside the city, and blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as, a horse's, as horses' bridles for a distance of 1,600 stadia. Now, this imagery of enemies being trampled in the winepress and their blood overflowing all around is found three times in the Old Testament and is found in other apocalyptic literature. It's a gruesome, gruesome image. What makes it even more gruesome here is that the blood that flows out of this wine press of crushed people is as, is, is as high as horses' bridles, which would be about five feet, and it goes on for 1,600 stadia, which would be about 180 miles. So imagine an ocean of blood, um, five feet deep from here to Sioux Falls, South Dakota, or from here to Fargo, North Dakota. As far as the eye can see, five feet of blood. And if you think of this literally, how many millions and millions of people would you have to step on to get that amount of blood? And are we really to believe that at the end of time, an angel is going to come and gather up all of the different sinners of the world and put them in a vat, and then Jesus is going to step on them like, 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 like grapes, creating this overflow of blood that's going to be this 180 miles, five feet deep of, of a bloody ocean? What happened to Jesus that said, be like the Father and love your enemies unconditionally and turn the other cheek and lay down your life and serve your enemies and all of that? This is a very, very different Jesus, if you're taking it literally. But we should know by now that we're dealing with apocalyptic, a Picasso-type literature, and it's not meant to be literal. And if you take it literally, it comes up to be a very macabre, vicious, violent, vindictive uh, image. But if we look for it symbolically with the right eyes, looking for that lamb, you're going to see how it means the exact opposite of that. It's an anti-violence metaphor. Follow me on this here. Um, okay, first of all, notice this. The grapes that are gathered, they're not gathered because they're wicked or bad. There's nothing in the text that suggests this. They're gathered because they're ripe, which is simply saying it was time for them to be picked, time for them to be squished. Secondly, whenever you're dealing with a symbol in the book of Revelation, this isn't the kind of book you can just read once. You've got to read it over and over. And, and, and don't think of it chronologically. It's, it's in layers. It's got, it's got, like, depth to it. And so what happens in one spot, when, when it, for every symbol that you're, you're, you're treating, take, pay attention to where else that symbol might pop up. Because the function it has in one section will affect the meaning it has in this section. It's significant to note that throughout the book of Revelation, people are judged 
and punished, not by being stepped on like grapes in a vat. They're judged by being made to drink the blood of those who are stepped on in a vat. The judgment is in the drinking, not in the squishing. And so, for example, in Revelation 16, we read this. You are just in your judgments, O Holy One, you who are and who were, for they have shed the blood of your holy people and your prophets, these are the martyrs, and you have given them blood to drink as they deserve. The judgment is in the drinking, not in the squishing. And in fact, even in Revelation 14, the passage we're just dealing with here, the winepress passage, just prior to the winepress thing, we read this. It says, if anyone worships the beast and its image and receives its mark on their foreheads or on their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured out full strength into the cup of his wrath. The judgment is in the drinking, not the squishing. So in contrast to the winepress images of the Old Testament, God's wrath here isn't towards the grapes that are crushed, it's towards those who now have to drink the, the blood of those who were crushed. So who are these poor grapes? Well, if they're drinking the blood of God's people, the martyrs, the grapes have got to be God's people, the martyrs, the ones that they crushed. And, and, and but don't feel sorry for these grapes. No, what, what the grapes go through is unpleasant for sure. No one would wish it upon them. But remember, the main theme of Revelation is this is how they overcome. This is how they're victorious. They were squished just like Jesus was squished. The they're not the ones being judged. It's those who have to drink the juice that comes from that vat that are judged. So what's this metaphor about drinking juice all about? Um, what's the meaning of this? Is, is it just that when God comes back, he's going to make these people um, uh, drink a nasty drink? No, it, it's, it's uh, like, drink this cup of blood and go sit in the corner, you murderer. No, it, it, that's not the point. It's not literal. It's John's ingenious way of saying that the sin of people comes back on them. The blood you shed is the blood that you're going to end up drink. drink. He's turning this violent metaphor on its head, so it's no longer about God's people crushing foes, God and his people crushing foes and being victorious. It's rather about God and his people being crushed by foes. That's how they're victorious. And the judgment isn't on the grapes that are crushed. It's on those who have to drink it. And that's John's way of showing it, that, that the evil you sow is the evil you reap. The evil you've done is the evil that will come back on you. The blood you've shed is the blood you will drink. In other words, the self-destructive consequences of your evil and rebellion will come back on you. John ingeniously communicates this in different ways in the book of Revelation. With regard to this drinking blood, it's significant that three times in Revelation, drinking blood is a symbol for the sin that people are committing. That's their sin. Because that was a sin in Jewish culture to drink any kind of blood. It still is pretty gross, if you ask me. Uh, but two times, it's a symbol not of their sin, but of the judgment for their sin. He uses the same symbol for both, which is an ingenious way of saying these people are drinking their own judgment. They're bringing judgment upon themselves. Sin is inherently self-destructive, and violence is inherently self-destructive, and so these people are voluntarily bringing this on themselves. It's also indicated by the fact that sometimes drinking blood is what these people want to do. It's not something they're made to do. They choose it for themselves. So, for example, we're in the Revelation 17 talking about the prostitute, which symbolizes the immorality of the kingdoms. It says this, I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of God's holy people, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. That's all we do. We just testify that this is the true way of living. Now, here this lady is drunk with the blood of God's holy people. If it's literal, I don't know how you can get drunk drinking blood. Drink as much blood as you want, and you may vomit, but you're not going to get drunk. But see, this is, again, not literal. This is a metaphor. This lady is intoxicated with shedding blood. She's just intoxicated with it. She's drinking it. And yet drinking blood is the punishment for shedding blood. And so it's John's way of showing that, that she's drinking judgment on her. She's intoxicated with that which is going to destroy her. She's bringing it on herself. That divine judgment is a matter of the inherent self-destructive nature of sin coming back on us. You find this throughout the whole Bible. In fact, in this book I'm doing now, Crucifixion of the Warrior God, I've got 70 pages of examples where the judgment for sin is built into the sin itself. Uh, it's, it's succinctly expressed in Psalm 7, where the, the psalmist says this, Those who are pregnant with evil conceive trouble and give birth to disillusionment. Those who dig a hole and scoop it out fall into the pit they have made. The trouble they cause recoils on them. Their violence comes down on their own heads. Look at that. If you're pregnant with evil, you're going to give birth to disillusionment. There's a natural cause and effect there. If, if you dig a hole to try to trap somebody, you're going to fall in that same hole. If, uh, you're, if you're, in, you're getting, causing trouble, it's going to recoil back on you. 
Whatever violence you are involved in is going to come back on your own head. If you live by the sword, you die by the sword. And if history shows us anything, it's the truth of that. It always comes back on us. Uh, God, in his mercy, protects people from the self-destructive consequences that are built into their sin. And if he didn't do that, we would die the first time we we sinned. In his mercy, he protects us. But there can come a point where God sees that it's not doing any good. We're just getting harder in our sin. He's enabling us. And so God then, with a grieving heart, like Jesus wept over Jerusalem, the judgment of Jerusalem, with a grieving heart, he has to withdraw. And now people suffer the consequences of their sin. You find that throughout the whole Bible. In fact, this is applied to Satan, uh, or at least a a passage that the church traditionally attributed to Satan in Ezekiel 29. It says, and here the Lord is speaking in the future past tense, which means you speak about the future as though it already happened. He says, I made a fire come out of you, and it consumed you. Here the Lord is calling the fire out of Satan himself. It's like he's calling out his true character, and once that true character is manifested, it consumes him. It doesn't mean Satan ends up self-destructing. Which, by the way, folks, is exactly what happened on Calvary. This is all about Calvary. On Calvary, on the cross, Satan, in his evil, in his bl- the blindness caused by his own evil, he orchestrates the crucifixion. And that very crucifixion is the thing that does him in. So Paul says in Colossians 2.15 that when, when, when Jesus was nailed to the cross, our sins were nailed to the cross, and Satan was disempowered, and the powers were made a mockery of. They've been defeated. So the cross defeats Satan, and yet Satan is the one who brought about the cross. Satan self-destructs. His evil character self-implodes. The fire that was in him consumed him. Yes. All God does is withdraw and allow allow sin to run its course, allow evil to run its course. This is what happens on Calvary uh, towards Jesus. Jesus stands in our place as a sinner, right, and and suffers what we deserve um, and and, and bears the judgment that, that, that we deserved. But notice, God never lifts a finger towards Jesus. God doesn't act violently towards Jesus. God's not angry with Jesus. No, but as Jesus stands in our place, all the Father does is withdraw. That's why Jesus says, why have you forsaken me? He withdraws his protection, his presence, and he turns him over. We read that motif all over the place in the New Testament. He turns him over to the wicked people and the principalities and powers that want to devour him. And all of the violence in the judgment of Calvary, and remember, all of our thinking about God should be based on the cross, and all of our reading of Scripture should be read through the lens of the cross. Here, all of the violence is done by agents other than God. God doesn't, God doesn't act any, violently at all. He just withdraws. The violence is caused by people and by angelic beings. And in doing that, Jesus is manifesting what it is to suffer the consequences for the sin of the entire world. He bears the consequences that we deserve. And that is the wrath of God. That's the, that, that's the judgment of God. It's simply the consequences that are built into the sin uh, that, that, that people uh, are involved in. This, I believe, is how all judgment takes place in the book of Revelation. Um, God is involved in the judgments only in the sense that he created this world with this moral order of cause and effect, and in the sense that he decides when it's time that he has to withdraw and allow those things to take place. But all actual violence is caused by agents other than God who are biting at the bit to do what they want to do, and they shouldn't be doing it, but uh, they are, and and, and so evil ends up self-imploding. As I see it, folks, and this is just my perspective, take it for what it's worth. If it fits, wear it. If not, come up with something better. But I see the day of judgment about which I don't think we have any literal details, but it's a time of truth. The day of the Lord is the day of truth. When the veil will be pulled back and we'll see God as he truly is and the beauty of his self-sacrificial love and the awesomeness of his, of his holiness. We'll see that. And, and the, the, the truth about us is going to be unveiled. Uh, all facades are going to be removed. We don't see things very accurately right, right now. Deception is going to be removed. Our thinking is going to be removed. Our, our pretense is going to be removed. Who we truly are will be there, and who God truly is will be there. And here's the thing. Whatever in us is compatible with that uh, or salvageable will be refined by the fire of his love. Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians 3. See, this is what the New Testament talks about on the day of judgment. All, everything in darkness will be brought to light. The secrets shall be shouted from the rooftops. Everything is going to be clear. This is, what, this is reality. This is what is real. And everything that is consistent with God's character will be refined and made fit for the kingdom. And everything that is incorrigibly, irrevocably set against that character, well, it will suffer the consequences of that. And to reject the God of life is death. It, it, it's, there's no other alternative. Uh, and if that's what they choose, that's what they choose. And as I see it, that is the judgment. That's hell. God doesn't have to act violently to do that. It's, it's built into the resistance itself. 
If you're going to be this kind of person in the presence of God, well, this is the effect it's going to have. Uh, and, and you're not compatible with it. You're not compatible with reality. It's like someone jumping off a skyscraper. Uh, you know, their head is not compatible, compatible with the reality of what they're going to hit when they get to the bottom. Uh, you know, you're trying to defy the reality of gravity. Well, you can't defy the reality of God for eternity. Uh, it, it, you're either compatible with it or you're not. So judgment is about saying what is true and all the consequences that go along with that are, are done. So in my view, God doesn't. It, the Jesus of the book of Revelation is no different from the Jesus of the Gospels. In fact, the Jesus of Revelation is the Jesus of the Gospels on the cross. This is all about the truth of the cross, the victory of the cross, confronting the lies of Babylon. And so I hope I've said enough here to help us see that this isn't book primarily about the future. It's about us today. Because we today, as much as the Jesus' disciples in the first century, we need to defy Babylon. We need to defy the dragon. We need to defy the prostitute. We're called to live in a subversive, resistant way against the ways of all the empires of this world, and all of them are under the authority of the dragon. We are, instead of, instead of conforming to the ways of the beast and the prostitute, we are to follow the lamb wherever he goes. Our trust is to be in lamb-like power, not in Babylon power. It's to be trust in the, the power of self-sacrificial love, the power of serving people, which alone can transform people. We're to have no trust in the power of might, in the power of, of, of the political regime, the military regime, the bombs, the missiles, the, the laws, or in manipulation, coercion, shaming, whatever. We're to have no trust in that. All of our trust is to be in the power of the lamb. And though the world may see it as weak and foolish, we know that it is the power of God. We know that it's the way to overcome. And if we die, we die. If we suffer, we suffer. But that isn't to be bad news for us. If we're grapes that get squished, well, we're grapes that get squished. But for grapes who know the secret of the scroll, the secret of Calvary, the secret of Revelation, uh, this, is, this is the way towards victory. We're participating in the victory of the Lamb. We, we're, we're not getting squished with his squishiness. And we will therefore overcome in the way he overcome. It's not bad news at all. It's, it's good news. We're called to resist, which is not a pleasant way to live, uh, but to be a nonconformist, to be a, a, a revolter to the ways of the empire. No, that sometimes may get you killed. But if Revelation means anything, it means that that is not good news, folks. That is how we overcome. Not with bombs and bullets and guns and swords, but with the word of our testimony and by the blood of the Lamb. And that's what Revelation is all about. And that's all i got to say about that. Amen. Amen. All right. I did it. i got one minute left. Uh, I apologize for the density of that. Uh, it, it was intense, but it needed to be. I, I hope, I, I, my goal is just to give a, the kind of the keys to how to read this thing. When you unlock it, 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 it's like a magic eye picture, you know, where it looks like just blurry wallpaper, but all of a sudden the three-dimensional thing jumps out at you. Uh, when, when you see this way of reading this book, and, and, and you're trusting that God really is the, the, the little slain lamb, bam, that little slain lamb jumps out at you. It's all about Calvary, the victory of Calvary. And it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful book. Huh, praise God. All right, I'm going to uh, close in prayer. Would you stand? Uh, I'd like to ask the prayer teams to come up here. And if you have any need whatsoever that could use prayer, I encourage you to come up here and pray with these folks, whatever it may be, um, as well as during the worship time. As we leave here, if you are not a follower of the Lamb, I encourage you to become one today. Just surrender your life to Him. Come up here and tell these people uh, the decision you made. And if you are a committed follower of the Lamb, then I send us out of here uh, with a prayer that we will uh, faithfully follow the Lamb wherever He goes that our confidence will be in lamb-like power, never in Babylon power, and that we'll be a people who are willing to bleed for others, as we have been as a congregation, that we look for acts of uh, opportunities to serve, opportunities to share, opportunities to bleed on behalf of others, to manifest the truth that that way of living overcomes the world and wins in the end. Hallelujah. God bless you guys. Go out and bleed on the world. Love you.